Hi everybody and welcome to Talking Teal Season 6, Episode 10. I'm Liron Cohen. And I'm Mimi Torchin. And we're Lady Parts TV. Thank you for joining us yet another week. We don't have too many of those left to go. No. Before we get started, I just want to make a little kind of blanket statement. Uh, many of you, many of you have kind of been sending me either uh, comparisons of this season to last, to previous seasons, or talking about a potential spin-off, or comparing Bally to Rally, all sorts of things that are really not about Episode 10 specifically. And so, uh, if you don't mind, please, all of you, save all those comments. I can't really refer to them uh, on Talking Teal, you know, that's dedicated to this specific episode because it's not completely related. However, save them. We do have a Talking Teal rep party at the end of all of this, and that would be a perfect time for you to bring up all of these kind of overall season, overall uh, discussions. Um, and then you can either send in what you already wrote, or maybe by the time uh, you know, the party happens, you'll change your mind, or you'll have something to add, or change, or whatever. Um, or you can you know, make it into a creative something, rather. If you're telling me about a spin-off you would like to see, yeah, that's write an something, idea. right? Exactly. Write a synopsis, write a scene. Uh, if you're talking about... Um, Do a character breakdown. Exactly. If you're talking about comparing the season to a previous season, how about do it on a video so we can see your face while you're telling us or about sock it. Puppets. Or sock puppets. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the possibilities are endless. <laughs> and we would love all of them. So um, please save all of those and do bring them up when, we, when it's time for the party. Now, speaking of the party, um, the party will happen, I think it happens uh, September 16th this year. It's exactly one... It's the Sunday after the last uh, episode. episode, so if we're doing Talking Teal uh, episode 12, the following week you will be the party. Uh, so start thinking about your contributions already because that means uh, the submissions I'll probably ask for by September 13th or so. So that means you have just a bit over two weeks to get them done. So start thinking about your submissions. I will... What? Pop sockets? Uh, pop, pop sockets? <laughs> Sonic <laughs> puppets? Pop sockets. <laughs> I'm talking in anagrams today. Uh, <laughs> um, I will in the next few days post uh, uh, an actual post that describes what I'm looking for, what, how you do it, whatever, all those things, and it will be a guideline. But if you've done it before, if you know how talking to rap parties go, then start thinking about your submissions. Um, and also there will be a survey that just anybody and all of you can answer in a very easy way, but that will be posted right after um, episode 12 airs. All right, so now we're talking about Fractured. Fractured. Fractured, written by Pete McTie uh, and directed by Fiona Banks again. Now, when we finished watching the episode, and, and as we said many times before, Pete McTie is one He's of the, the best writers. He's He's as we always say, you know, knows how to weave these storylines together. And we were really impressed by the episode, especially since the previous episode, not so much. Um, so I was very surprised to see that you guys had all sorts of many different opinions. And this is just a sample now of some of your opinions on this episode as a whole before we get into the actual breakdown of the episode. So first of all, I know you have a few of your own, but I'll, I have a few short ones that I'll... Oh, read I first. have many of my own. Pages uh, <laughs> and pages and pages. So, for example, we have Shannon who said, The storylines are all over the map and I find myself myself not very interested in any of them at this point, which is sad because I really do like this show. We have Thera. We have a lot of Thera. new writers, by the way. Thank you. We're, we're nice so happy name. to get uh, more diverse uh, opinions over there. Yes, Thera is from the Netherlands. And she says, my first reaction to this episode was that it was really slow. It felt like a filler episode to me. Nothing major has happened. That's surprising to me Gee, since I felt a, a lot happened. It was a pretty big happened. episode. <laughs> um, then we have Diana who says, to me this episode had far too many plot lines and far too many moments of great acting all concentrated into 45 minutes when at least an hour was needed. And she gives an example. Katrina's performance was simply flawless oh, and heartbreaking. But then the audience is asked to absorb that and move on. So the, between Celia and Mar, I mean uh, Liz and Mari and Kat and all, she felt that it was too much and like just little, too little of. of I, I just have to say that I do agree, perhaps about storylines, but I don't think you can ever have too much great acting. No, no. What she said is that it was so such great acting, but we were asked to move on from it too uh -huh, quickly. Too soon. That it was so powerful, but not enough dedicated to it. I, I think that's what you meant, Diana. Mm -hmm. um, now tell us what Lauren, Susan, and Sarah said. <laughs> My turn. Uh, so Lauren says, Fractured was very much an apt name for this episode. 
I feel as though all character relationships are becoming more and more fractured as well as Liz's mind and memory. My love for the show is also becoming fractured. Uh oh. There are m many pieces I loved and want to love, but also a lot of disconnection to it, too. Quite frankly, there is so much darkness and unhappiness in the episodes currently that I'm just not really enjoying it. I'd like something to feel like I can get behind. Everyone seems to be corrupt, keeping secrets, hurting other people, or just not themselves. Seriously ill. Could the writers please give us something to keep us going at least? Something to believe in? I feel like they toy with things such as Boomer getting along with Liz, and then that whole awful storyline they give us destroys what was just becoming beginning to bloom every time. I guess that is the show now. Well, that made me sad. But, it, you know, we, we, we mentioned that before in previous seasons, that they sometimes just, it seems to be too dark. I felt that there was some uh, heart and... Uh, yeah, but I, I, I did too, but uh, I in mean, terms it is of, a prison drama. In terms of the... the no, but it's... It, in terms of the individual characters, they mm -hmm. do feel all like they're just going down a rabbit hole mm -hmm. of some sort or another. Um, let's see what Susan said. Susan says, only two episodes left and the main storyline is still Ferguson? <laughs> Uh, they should have wrapped it up early like they did with Frankie and take the rest of the season and focus on the new characters. I'm with you on that. Mm -hmm, me too. My big issue is this. If they knew seven, season, season seven. seven was the last, which they should have, as per Australian production incentives, incentives only last up to 65 hours after that protect, protect, I'm, I'm protection? Like, protection costs <laughs> go up astronomically. Why? Why are Ooh. they still? I'm an actor. <laughs> are they still focused on Ferguson? And why bring in new cast with only two seasons if you're not going to fully explore these characters? And for that matter, they might as well have started making the fans happy with some fanfic storylines. I'm assuming she means fanfic type type story. Um, now I, I just want to say that uh, yes, they should have suspected that season seven might be the last one, and hopefully they did, and hopefully they. Uh, wrapped it up in a way that would still allow them to go on if they had the, mm -hmm. the opportunity, but if not, then it was satisfying. Uh, but they they didn't really know that season seven was going to be the last one. It yes, was but they should have, I think, prepared. behaved as yeah, though they should have prepared for it that. could be. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. agree with that. And yeah. we don't know what seven is going to bring us anyway. Right. Yeah. So, um, mm. okay. Sarah. <laughs> okay. Now, Sarah, on the other hand, had an entirely different uh, take on this. Yes, and I like that Sarah actually picked something yeah, because, positive. Because Sarah to, actually um, spent the entire season talking about how much she doesn't connect, how much she doesn't, in, is, she hasn't been enjoying the season. So I, I really liked getting that from Sarah. Okay. The one thing I am liking about this season is the subtlety of the writing. Right on. This season is not about big events, but small, intimate moments. It's about one-on-one -on -one relationships. It's about slowly weaving these relationships together to create a tapestry that is different from any we've had on the show before. Part of the subtlety comes from the new characters. They are subtler in their approach to things. They aren't big and brass and in your face. Excuse me. They take care of themselves. They move about getting things done on the quiet. I think the fact that there isn't an obvious struggle for top dog is another huge shift in storytelling. It's true. Mm -hmm. That power struggle has been at the center of prison life since the beginning of Wentworth, or since the beginning of prison. <laughs> uh, the secondary through line became Ferguson's demise. That has now happened, though we're seeing the aftermath of it through the Vera Will Jake storyline. Now that B and Joan are gone, we're left with beloved characters who have always just plodded along on their own paths, intermixing with the others and the new characters, of which most of this season has focused on tuning us into who they are and what they are about. It's only now the weaving threads are starting to come together in a tighter fashion, bringing intriguing tension to the show as a whole. Yes, I think that that is also I think it's a very good um, analysis of the writing. Mm -hmm. And I think in many, I think that this is true. It doesn't mean that other things aren't true as no, well. No, I think they're all, I think they're all true. I think they're all hitting on... Uh, the show is so dense that uh, there's good, there's bad, there's... Uh, but when you focus in on that, the writing has been very interesting, and it has been a lot more subtle. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, Mari I is a very subtle character. We see her machinations, right. but uh, the way she works is extremely subtle. Right, there are... And it's true that the new characters, nobody is 
particularly big in a Ferguson or Sonia type way. They're 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 sub they're their work in subliminal ways. Mm -hmm. um, and they're so, wonderful. So we only have two episodes left. It's kind of hard to imagine that they're going to wrap, I mean, I'm assuming that they'll leave us with a cliffhanger, but that they will manage to wrap up some of these things into episodes, which kind of worries me that they're going to hasten it and, and have to, you know, again, do a, a what is it called? A Duza, Duza Machina? Or oh, Duza Ex Machina. Duza Ex Machina. When, you know, like, divine intervention all of a sudden makes thing, things happen. Uh, because they didn't have time to actually, you know, unfold correctly. Um, so we'll, but we'll see. You know, they are masters of of uh, yes, they surprising are. us. So let's start talking about Ruby and Allie, your favorite well, subject. Must we? <laughs> um, because we do have problems uh, again, different problems. I mean, same problems, but uh, the, the main problem is they shouldn't be together. Right, but we actually didn't see too much of them together this episode. But we see that we saw other things that were problematic. You so mean, didn't Allie mount Ruby at all this episode? I uh, think no, so. we had more no. flirtation. We had uh, kind of caressing and things. Um, but first of all, I think the biggest uh, problem in this episode of them together was that Allie got her first visit in ever, ever. <laughs> and it was strictly for the purpose of having her in the visitors' room at the same time, so she could see Shelley. Now. Uh, first of all, yes, it's very convenient that she just happened to have her first visitor visitor in a room ever a table filled with with visitors. No, she only had one visitor. Are you sure? Yes. Oh, okay. She only had one, one visitor who we don't whose identity we will never she? find out. Um, and it was at the same time when Shelley came to visit Ruby. Now the problem to me is that again because they have been using Ali as a plot device strictly as a plot device. If she had her own storyline, they could have had a visitor that actually meant, meant something, something, and then it would have been great to have both of their plot lines kind of intersect at, in that visitor room. But otherwise, it just kind of in your face again, oh, look, Allie has her first visit since we've ever known her, and it's, we don't know, we're never, we're gonna, we're, blah, 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 blah. we're never gonna find out who that visitor is because it's meaningless. It's all for, you know, to serve Ruby's plot. Again, a character who is new, whom we barely have any attachment to, as opposed to a character we love, who we've been with for quite a few years now, who wasn't attached to a character that was, you know, the main character of the story, and she is serving her, which I don't get. No, because it is such a waste. Yes, that's the key word. Jenko is a fantastic actress. As we've said many times. And Allie is a very complex character. Uh... And yeah. she's not written that way no, anymore. No, she's not. Mm -mm. Now, Linda is asking, why lie to someone you love? And in that question, we have the two problems. First of all, the first problem is some of you were not sure about what she was lying about. What she was lying about was that she told Allie that uh, Shelley was just a mate. She didn't tell that she was either her current lover, her ex-lover, though she did tell Rita at the time, she, she referred to her as my woman, that she, they were together at the bar. Um, so that's the first problem. The second problem is her telling Rita that she loves Allie. And uh, a lot of you had problems with that because, uh, well, because it's like, where did that come from? Well, from, I think from that she could fuck, love Allie. From let's I, fuck to... Allie is I, very I, lovable. I her. Yes, but it was like a love... I know. It, and... And, uh, and I she believe, doesn't treat her like someone I believe she Diana loves. was the one mm -hmm. who mentioned this, but I just have to say this because it's so true. We had two love confessions in this episode. We had Ruby to Rita about Allie, and we had um, Zara. Zara to Mari. And Zara to Mari was so believable. We've known them so for heartfelt. such a short well, time. Diana yes, that's what I just said. That. We, we've known them for such a short time, but her love confession was so real. So from the heart. And, and you could tell from the way she behaves. Exactly. Her whole life is in service of Mari. Exactly. And for what other than the fact that she loves her? Exactly. But with Ruby, it kind of feels, again, forced and rushed and, like, out of nowhere. So let's start with what yes, Diana has to say. Unfortunately, we've already said everything Diana but I wanted, has to say. But I wanted, wanted to let, address it yes. more uh, uh, thoroughly. When Ruby tells Rita that she loves Allie, Christ on a bleeding bicycle. Hmm. How is the audience meant to react to that? Yes, I know it's a soap opera, and so no one is allowed to be happy for more than a few scenes, and obviously the writers had to split up Ruby and Allie so they could well, then reunite them for another nanosecond or two oh, next series. Well, I don't know yet that they're going to, I mean, the fact that yeah, Rita wanted, wants her to uh, stay away from her, we don't know that yeah. she's going to. 
but this felt like an insult to my intelligence. Luckily, I could console myself with Natalia Novikova's achingly done declaration of love for Maori. That was much better written and superbly acted. Right. And we are with you on that, Diana, yes. as you know, because we just said it. Yes, and we'll talk more about Mari and, and Drago later, but uh, it's true that when you compare the two love confessions, there's no doubt that one feels real, the other one does not. Yeah, the other one feels uh, like a plot device, and one feels like it comes from the heart and the soul. Yeah. Now let's see what Rachel has to say. Rachel says, if that's... True that, that she loves Alice. Yes, if that's true, Ruby has a really fucked up sense of what love is, and that could very well be true. Many that could people very do. Well be true, yes. um, I really tried to give this relationship a chance, but in my book, the mighty tit ship has sunk. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly don't care if Mari finds out that Ruby is responsible for Danny's death. Worse yet, I'm hoping Allie will see Ruby for the mess she is sooner rather than later. I just don't want to see these two together anymore. And I have to say, I have felt that way since the very beginning, and it certainly hasn't lessened. No. I feel that way more and more every time I see them Yeah, together. it doesn't help. It's, isn't it funny that you, you sometimes yeah. you have to just get used get to a used couple to something, or something? No, they it grow just... on you. This is, grows on me like a fungus. <laughs> it, uh, you know. Yes, and part of that is for another reason, which I'll mention in a second. Uh, Shannon says, it will be interesting to see if Ruby takes Rita's advice and dumps Allie. Not that anyone would be upset about that. But it will be even more painful to watch Jenko trying to convince us that Ali is bothered by. Yeah, that she gives another a, thing. Uh, damn. You know, to see a uh, to see a breakup of some a couple that we never really believed to begin with. Um, now, a couple of other problems. Uh, Bridget says, and I will preface this by saying I don't remember that conversation. Maybe you guys will. Uh, Rita and Ruby's dialogue reminded me of Frigid. Um, uh, uh, when the, Rita and Ruby were talking after uh, Rita's breakup from Ray, mm -hmm. um, and they were s they're saying something like, it's complicated, it shouldn't mm -hmm. be. She said it's, uh, it definitely uh, reminds her of a conversation Frigid had, I don't remember. Anyway, so she said, so please write new dialogue for Rita and Ruby. Their storyline needs Geritol. Uh, and uh, so that's Geritol's one problem. for old people. Yes, it I need gives Geritol. you an uh, energy boost or something, right? Um, and Diana says, you're not old. Uh, Diana says, um, sorry, about Ruby, and I think that's part of the problem here. It's very difficult to bring an audience with you through your character when who the character is gets flipped and changed from episode to episode. Now, I don't know if they attribute it to her brain injury uh -huh. or something, but it's true. One minute she's sweet, the other minute she is abrasive. A raging maniac. Well, not even a raging maniac. I don't know. That could be her brain injury. But I'm talking just in her interactions with people, mm -hmm. like with Rita or with Allie. One second she can be very sweet and loving. Yes. The other she can be very kind of offensive or Dismissive. or kind of just rude and obnoxious. So it's that's the problem to me. It's one thing that she sometimes gets sets off, you know, and, and goes off. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. That could be attributed to brain injury. It's another one. Her personality itself seems to be different from one scene to the next. You know, like she was so sweet with Rita, but I don't know. And I think that's a problem. She doesn't, she's not consistent in her mm -hmm. character. Now, Diana does have a prediction. And she's saying, I'm voting for Ruby's ex-girlfriend, Shelly, to have been the one who delivered the killer blow to Danny. Ruby obviously mm -hmm. doesn't know this because the writers have remembered she's got brain damage and so can't recall the details of Danny, of the attack on Danny. I think that since Ruby is the fighter, it makes more sense to me that yeah. she would be able to actually kill a man by giving him one, you know, punch. I don't see Shelly so much as, but who knows? Maybe that's how they met. Maybe they met boxing. <laughs> who knows? Uh, Shelly doesn't look like a boxer, but, you know, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Um, Maybe she does uh, Kung Fu or Tai Chi. Or tai Chi just... Zumba. <laughs> tai Chi is not going to make you knock somebody out with one Neither will Zumba. And neither will Zumba. <laughs> Even Tai Chi and Zumba. Um, yes. Um, again, I, I, uh, well, I completely lost my train of thought because how much you don't we went like on Ruby too far. Uh, yeah, but it was, oh, again, um, Shelley? I would have liked the story better if Ruby didn't even remember yes. it happening. Yes, that would have been cool. And mm -hmm. if somebody else would have either told Rita or Allie or somebody mm -hmm. and, yeah. By the way. Or maybe looking at the pictures might have brought something back, but that and and then it could be something else speaking of the pictures don't think we haven't noticed that Kaz when she goes into Mari's room to switch the drugs she she ling lingers on those pictures on her board 
So Kaz now knows something is going on. Maybe she managed to also see Ruby in those pictures. Um, so oh, I think she did. I think we zoomed in on a picture with the... Uh, not, I don't think, when Kaz was no? looking. No, no, it was when Allie was looking. Allie was seeing that and we saw that, but I don't think... Uh, Allie was seeing that so that she could see that Shelly was there. Um, but Ma uh, Kaz, they just gave us a little second of showing us that she was watching, she was looking at the pictures, mm -hmm. and they didn't do anything with that, and I think that it's going to it's gonna have ramifications later on. So speaking of Nothing cats, they do really just gets thrown in course. there for nothing. Every second has, yep. uh, which is to me a hallmark of very good writing, especially for something that has suspense in it, is that nothing is a throwaway. Yeah. So speaking of Kaz, we're now going to move to the uh, foursome, Liz, Mari, Kaz, and Drago. Um, it's an odd foursome. It's an odd foursome, oh. I know, but there was a lot going on between those four. So first of all, I have to say that I was very... The, the scenes between... Oh, look, we're... We're, yes, we're flanked. We're flanked by our <laughs> pussycats. Missy and Lulu. Um, the scenes between Liz and Mari were very interesting to me. Extremely interesting. So let's start with uh, what Lauren had to say all about right. uh, Mari. Lauren says, at least we got to see a bit of a close-up on Mari's manipulation this episode. She's like those plants who send out feelers everywhere, silently seeming benign while drawing people close, dangerously so. <coughs> Excuse me. Her role in confusing Liz and then offering her an opportunity to decide when she wants to die, so clever and calculating, seemed rather nasty. Uh, then her kissing Drago on the lips, obviously to keep her close after Zara's confession of love earlier in the episode. Terribly manipulative. Surely Drago sees that. She is clever enough. Ah, but love makes fools of us all. Love makes us blind. Uh, I'm sure that Drago does indeed love Mary, and when, you, and when you're in that deep, you accept being treated like a piece of shit just to be close <laughs> Very to Very <her>. good. <laughs> Very good. Now, uh, tell us what Sarah had to say. Sarah says, Mary is such a different type of character than we've had before. The fact that Liz has been so upfront with her, this is a very yes, interesting point. very. So upfront with her about being in the shower, witnessing the beating, that she has dementia, and not confessing that she's an alcoholic who is having a hard time coping with her illness and just wants to end it. Yes, you can argue that Liz is not in her right mind, but I don't see it that way. I think Liz knows exactly what she's doing. She doesn't feel threatened by Mary, as she did with Joan or Sonia. Mary is a different kind of threat. I'm so happy you said that, Sarah, because when we're seeing when Liz runs over to Mari and says, oh, it was Drago, or it was you, or it was whatever, and I thought to myself, yeah, she's not, you know, she's not constantly under the confusion, and, and I thought, that is a crazy thing for her to do. Why would she run over to somebody that she thinks is a killer and tell her, oh, I know it's you? And then I'm so happy you said that, because that makes total sense to me. That uh, Mari really doesn't feel threatening. No, she doesn't. And she's, she, you know, she comes if you need any help. And she comes and she actually try, tries to explain to her, I wasn't there, I couldn't have been there, you know. She, she tries to reason with her. She doesn't come and say, if you tell, if you talk, I'll kill, I'll you. kill you. Which She's a master manipulator. Right. And I, I guess I'm just uh, a sucker for someone being kind every once in a while. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, I've got hiccups. Um... But I think that in some ways, sometimes, Mari does have a little bit of humanity. I, I know it's all to, everything is about her keeping control, finding out who killed Danny, all of that stuff. But I think that, I don't know, I, I think that even though she wants Liz dead and she gives her that, there is some, um, there, it's like Mary, Mari kills people. Uh, <laughs> if you don't know that show, you should watch it's it. A, Mary kills people, fantastic. Uh, there is something to be said for taking your life on your own terms. Well, that was a, yes, that is a different story, and, and that specifically She didn't was, come and inject her. Well, somebody said, and I'm so sorry I don't remember right now, but somebody said that what she does, and she's, she's very right, she, she offers something Plants that... Plants a seed. She offers something that's beneficial to her, but she makes it sound beneficial to the right. other person. She's, she's very clever like that because she as Lauren said, has those feelers, and she knows what a person is looking for, what they need, and she, she knows how to sell it. Well, she's a businesswoman, yeah. and she does have actual empathy, but she uses it in her right. 
uh, in her best interest. Right, which is oftentimes so the other person's detriment. That's, uh, but that's, that's, I think, something that makes her very interesting is that she oh, is an empathetic definitely. character. She's a very uh, fascinating yeah. character. She's not a sociopath. She's very complex. Yeah, right, exactly. She, she's, uh, she's a criminal, but she's not a sociopath. Uh, yeah. yeah. Hawk? Hawk. Oh, we hate that. Oh, and it sounds so close. I might have to run out and, uh, you know, shake, wave my arms. Also, the, of course, the scenes between Kaz and Liz, beautiful as always. I just love when she finds her with, of course, perfect timing, right? She finds her just about to inject. Um, but I just love that she asks her for permission to uh, get rid of the drugs. She doesn't just take them and right. does what no. she wants to do. She asks for, for permission. And she also tells her, yes, you're right, you should have the choice, but you're not there yet. Yes. And I appreciate that she said that because I felt that she was saying, I'm with you, I'm going to help you, and don't worry when the time comes, I will help you, you know, make sure that it's your choice. And I just love Kat so much, and you can tell that she's already experienced this before with yes, her nan. That's you her can nan. tell. She's a wonderful character. Uh, um, I'm in love with Kat. And she treats, the thing is, is that she treats people with respect. Mm -hmm. uh, even, um, she knows what Liz is going through, she doesn't treat her uh, condescendingly at no, all. No, not at all. She doesn't uh, infantilize her or anything like mm -hmm. that. She's very, very sweet. Um, I love Kaz. I really am in love with Kaz. I want, if season seven really ends up being the last, I want Kaz to be triumphant. In yes, the me too. Um, now, speaking of Liz, uh, Rachel says, we don't want to lose Liz, but watching this descent week after week is painful, and I'm not sure how much more of it I can take. I'm still holding out hope that the diagnosis is incorrect, but the hope is fading quickly. So we've been saying that we really hope that the diagnosis was incorrect, and I, I'll tell you why, actually, I'm, I'm kind of the opposite of this. Rachel says that her hope is fading quickly. I think because it's such a rapid deterioration and because we know that she's in season seven, I mean, I'm pretty sure we actually know that, then I, I just can't see how from here they have so many more episodes to make her decline more and more and more. I think it's happening so quickly, they can't no. stretch it out that long. So I'm actually... Because she'll be, you know, she'll, she'll be sitting in the corner Yeah, staring. and what's the point of that? So to me, that actually is more of a an encouraging uh, um, fact that I think that actually they're going to find that it's something else. What do you think? I, I do. Yeah. I, I've always thought that. Um, I mean, I haven't always thought it, but I thought it pretty soon on because they did so little testing on her. Yeah. That to me was sort of the dead giveaway. Oh, she got to mention we did a little. Right. We did a little oral test. Yeah. And. Uh, and that's it. <laughs> um, so now the. Uh, Kaz and Mary side of this uh, foursome is also a very interesting dynamic. Um, Sarah well, that's says, between two equals, almost. Two equals that have so much history. And Lauren says, and I, I, I'm so with you on that, Lauren, I wish we could see more of that history because it's obvious that they have a lot of history mm -hmm. together. Kaz really knows her and hates her so much that she's willing to kill her even though she doesn't usually like to hurt women in general, even if they're bad Bad men. women. Uh -huh. um, but Sarah says, Kaz and Mary are different as characters to the other powerful women we've had on the show. Again, they work with relationships and quiet actions. That's very true. Again, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a, such a subtle uh, rivalry because they are two women who are usually in control of their emotions, uh, who are not just, oh, I'll just kill her and that's it, or I'll bash her, you know. Mm -hmm. They're much more uh, interesting, and, uh, and they, their rivalry is more on a mental, intellectual kind of level. Um, Which is always interesting. Fascinating. Um, now, speaking of Kaz, uh, what does Sarah have to say about Kaz? The top dog storyline this season is less about someone fighting Kaz for the position and more about her struggling to be a good top dog. It's about her own feelings of inadequacy. I see a similar inner struggle with both Kaz and Vera. They both care about the women. They both want to do their absolute best for everyone, but they are constantly faced with obstacles and failures, making them question their abilities. I think that's, again... It's a very, very apt comparison. Yes, and such a good point, that uh, because Sarah was the one who was talking about how there isn't a fight for Top Dog this season. It's true. The fight this season is within Kaz of what kind of top dog she wants to be or has to be. And I think that journey has been... I think Kaz's journey of all the characters this season, Kaz's journey was the one that I felt was most relatable and interesting mm -hmm. to me. And I really, really enjoyed it. And you she could grew follow the, the line. 
you know, from beginning to now. Yes, and even uh, though she became a little more ruthless in her top dog behavior, a little more than she used to well, be. She, she had to. to. Absolutely. But it didn't compromise her morals. It didn't compromise. It actually, I think, made her more uh, relatable and lovable to me because you can see the conflict. You can see when she doesn't want to do something, but she knows she needs to. She prioritizes who she needs to protect and who doesn't deserve her protection. And to the point that Allie accepted her fate, yeah. She had to. She knew she had to to keep Kaz in control. And Kaz is who they need to be in control. And it didn't end up having any kind of bad uh, implications for their relationship as far as we can no. see. It just, it was what it was and then they moved on. And, I really and also like I give Allie kudos for yes. that. I don't know that Allie got enough uh, Well, um, because they barely give Allie anything. <laughs> for, for understanding the nature of... Uh, what the punishment was, that it was not something Kaz wanted, it was something that had to be in order for it to be better for everybody. Yeah. And she just submitted to it. Yep. Um, now what does Denise have to say about Kaz? Denise says, Kaz has grown so much through the last three seasons. She has finally accepted the job of being top dog, which is more than just threatening to do something if any of the women are hurt. I agree with her wanting to have a more peaceful life in prison for the women, but many of these ladies are not very nice people. So Kaz has to step up to the plate, and this thing with Liz propelled her there. Yeah. And it's funny, though, when she says uh, uh, some of these uh, ladies are not, not very, very nice, nice people. people. I think a lot of ladies in prison are not very nice. Say, this is prison. She's going to have to go through a lot of uh, not nice people before she no. gets to... Yeah, but no. This but is it's, not a PTA. Uh, <laughs> but actually, I think that this prison is a little um, more... A little less truly representative of the peop the women in prison because women in prison are not always you know crazy. So actually, I think oftentimes what we've learned is that women get to prison because of men because they have been badly treated by men mm -hmm. by, by their either their fathers, their their partners, and they end up having to do things that they or they're do. drawn into the the men's plots. Yeah. Uh, yeah, or they have to protect themselves, mm -hmm. or or uh, women who have been abused by their fathers end up having, you know, doing, getting into drugs or getting into all sorts of bad lifestyles. So actually, there are no prisons on Paradise Island. <laughs> Not when Amazon. Uh, I'm just thinking together. about Paradise Cove. That's <laughs> a Glow reference since uh, we've been so into we Glow. We have so been binging on Glow, <laughs> which we adore. So Kaz also delivers my favorite line of this episode, which is the closing line of this episode, which is some junkie overdosed, which is a brilliant way to close the episode. Um, and before we go to your predictions, and you have many predictions, um, I want to mention, we finally mention, we're finally mentioning the name, uh, I, I kind of feel like she's earned it, uh, Natalia Novi Novikova, uh, who plays Zara Drago. And uh, I just loved her in this episode because... Up until now, she was as we, she was, you know, she was the henchwoman. She was the ba the basha, uh, which more didn't, than a basha, which didn't give her uh, much uh, complexity. No, no layers, dimension whatsoever. No, but this episode with the love confession uh, and with her little speech of how you know she's kind of willing to let her treat her like shit and look down on her because she loves her so much, but she does the things that she doesn't have the courage to do. And as she said, she tells her, uh, "This is my decision now because it's on me, not you." Uh, so she's kind of a little empowered, mm -hmm. uh, but also we get a little bit of a glimpse yes, into who see she that she's is. not just a big, dumb uh, puncher. Yep. Uh, I really, really, really uh, liked seeing what they did with her this episode. Um, and uh, so, now to your predictions. Uh, now, first of all, Shannon does remind us that Taylor survived the rat poison, so there's no reason to yep. you know, think that except, Mary can't. Yeah, true. Except, yes, yes, yes. yes. Exactly. Uh, now let's go to Sharon. But they caught Taylor very quickly. Uh, uh, well, they, they seem to have caught Mary, Mary pretty quickly, but I don't know. Uh, um, they Taylor, saw Taylor, said, Taylor fall before their, their very eyes. And so Taylor she was said rushed. she only tasted, tasted a little it, bit. Tasted it, exactly. I don't know how much Mari I can assure you Mari took but a Mari nice But Mari also big, usually uh, uh, inhales rather than uh, and shoots or something, mm -hmm. or something. So I, uh, I don't know if that's the same effect. Uh, but I can tell you, Yes, we'll go to your predictions, but I can tell you that Lauren knows for a fact, and I will not tell you how she knows, but trust me, it's a reliable source, that Mary is going to be in season seven. And anyway, to have Susie Porter on for not even the whole of season what six would be, would be the crazy. point? It would be crazy. So we are assuming she'll survive, and most of you have assumed as yes. well. 
uh, Sh Shannon, yes. Shannon says, looks like they're setting up for a face-off between Kaz and Drago when Drago finds out what Kaz did. And you know, mm -hmm. and you know she's going to. Especially now that we know she's so in love with her, she mm -hmm. will do anything. That could also be the season finale cliffhanger. I hope not. Yeah. That's an interesting sound. <laughs> Never a lack of interesting sounds in the country. Um, we also haven't had a good old-fashioned top dog beatdown in the laundry room in quite some time now, not since the epic battle between Bee and Frankie in season two. We might finally get to see what kind of fighter Kaz really is when her back is against a wall. Although I think the real fight should be between Kaz and Mari, and it would be over Allie. At least that fight would make more sense. Yeah, to me it's a, the, a fight for top dog. Mari can't physically fight. Yeah, I was just going to say Mari is not a fighter. So it would be kind of weird to have Drago fight in on her behalf. So, But I don't see Drago fighting to be herself top dog. So I don't know. I don't know that it's going to be a fight for top dog. I think Sarah hit the nail on the head. This year is not about a fight for top dog, um, which I prefer, you know, enough with that for a while. Um, yeah. But I Kaz think has proven herself to be an, uh, a good enough top dog, and and <laughs> the doves, the doves. Really, when you think about it, who wants to be top dog? And the thing is also that like who uh, wants to be president? Um, and uh, the the women seems to seem to be fairly okay with her. Mm -hmm. it's not, it doesn't seem like oh, they are constantly oh she's a sh except no, for Boomer. she's fair except for Boomer mm -hmm. this episode because of Sonia. But the, also the thing is, Shannon says you know the, the fight should have been between Kaz and Mary over Ali. I don't see that happening. Even though I completely agree with you, when Mari came into prison, I thought oh this is going to be that triangle yep. is going to be the center. And no, it ended up kind of being Ali is nobody. Uh, her relationship with Mari really went nowhere, even though they are the ones who had chemistry. And they were in, and they lived together. They Every raised night. a child together. A child they, who died. Who should died. Have brought them together. No, 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 no. I think yeah. it was a, I, I think that that was a big error in judgment. Yes, they um, went in one direction, but they really should have, should gone, have gone the, the other. other. Mm -hmm. But let's see what Sam has to say. Uh, Sam says, Kaz pulled a badass move, <laughs> but I think Mari is too strong an antagonist to leave now. She is vicious. Unlike the freak, Mary has not overstayed her welcome. I love absolutely. that. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely on the money. And I would like her around through next season. I think Rita will be credited with saving Mary's life, which will, will restore trust between them. Hmm. Rita will get the inside intel she needs for her cover, undercover op. Well, I think she has to get her inside, uh, her intel because um, Susie... Susie Porter. Um, Mari needs to stay in prison, and I think that Rita needs to provide evidence to really nail her beyond mm -hmm. the six months that she got for bashing That's Danny's right. doctor. She needs to be in for longer than that. So I definitely think that will happen, and we see Rita performing CPR on Mari, so mm -hmm. uh, that could be an, uh, an interesting way for her to get back, get into back her in her good, good graces. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I agree. Mari needs to stay. We, we like her. Oh yes, as, absolutely. We need a villain and she's a good villain. She's an excellent villain because she's not a mustachio twisting villain. She's, right. She's a very subtle, what will she do next? And as opposed to Ferguson, she's not a super villain. She is, she's, yes. she has flaws. She has um, vulnerabilities. Yes. So you don't think she's going to survive no matter what, because we haven't seen her survive things that, you know, a mortal would have been dead from many times. And because even though she has her mental manipulation and even though she usually has a bodyguard, she herself is physically very um, small. small. She's not, mm -hmm. you know, she can't protect herself. Um, okay, well, let's go to Diana. Diana says, I'm assuming that Marie will survive, Mary will survive, and having learned a salutary salutary lesson in drug purity, she'll provide Allie with some half-decent smack. No! And nice, junky acting opportunities. No, Maybe we had that. No, I know. But at least she'll be doing something. But no, I don't want it to no. happen. Maybe Allie will lean on Jake over the whole freak thing and smuggle the smack in via him. Again, we've seen this. Been there, done that. Don't not want interested it to in happen again. again. No. So let's move on to Denise. <laughs> Denise says, I think this whole thing with Mary and Zara will come to an end before the last episode of the season. I think Kaz will kill Zara and Mary is going to have to bow to Kaz for a while. I would least. like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, except that I'd miss Zara, kind no, of. No, yeah, but I, I mean, I like the idea of Mary having to actually, mm -hmm. yeah, to toe the line. Mm -hmm. I think Allie will find out Ruby killed Mary's son, and she will protect Ruby 
by keeping the secret, especially when she learns that Mary's son was a rapist. I'm, I don't see that. I think that Ali, regardless of anything, I think she Ali... Was a, she was connected to that yeah. boy. She helped raise him. Yeah, and she's not connected enough to Ruby to actually forgive her for that. Mm -hmm. So, um, Okay, so uh, these are some of your predictions. It will be, again, we, have, we only have two episodes to go, so it will be interesting how they'll manage to get all of that. Two episodes to go, wow. How they'll manage to wrap all of that. Um, Kathy says, Drago and Mari will continue to try and kill Liz. Kaz can't always be there, so Boomer needs to step up. Which brings us to... Boomer! First of all, Katrina Milosevic was oh God. so moving and beautiful in this episode, and at the same time had some of the most hilarious lines. Well, she really ran the gamut yeah. of emotions in this, and uh, she, she showed a depth that we have seen before, but this time it was... It was so obvious and evident of how vulnerable she is. And especially and how much she wants to be loved and um, taken seriously. And especially <clears throat> since Boomer has been there since the very beginning. And I, I always feel like we don't know enough about Boomer. and we, we don't see enough of Boomer. And so I'm always happy when they give her these little opportunities to show more of herself. Mm -hmm. uh, but she did. And actually, Boomer hasn't for a long time delivered you know, some of her good lines that she used to deliver. And so I, I at least remember three, the she cactus, which was funny, saying defecation instead of defamation. That was an easy <laughs> one, though. <clears throat> and everyone I know is here. Uh, but at the same time, again, when she was with the lawyer and, and she, she realized what Sonia had done for her and just her face, her you know, like face. so much with so little. Uh, which is not always what she does, because she does a lot, but she can do also a lot of subtlety. Um, now, I also love to see her finally being protective of Liz again, mm -hmm. being, you know, good with her. I love seeing them together, uh, that scene of them together in the slot with Liz bringing her Monte Carlos. Mm -hmm. and it was so beautiful and touching. Again, by the way, lighting was so beautiful on this show. Oh, me. well, physically the show is out of this world. Yeah. Um, now, Sonia getting the lawyer for Boomer. You have many different opinions on that. Now, before we get into your opinions, uh, I just want to say that if it really was true, if Sonia really did this with no ulterior motive, um, if it's really not going to end up being something else, if they're not just going to fizzle this you know, plot line as, as something that was supposed to just make us feel, I don't know, more gutted when she ends up in the slot, which is, would be cruel to mm -hmm. the audience, um, but if it really was true, then I love it. Me too. Because I love the fact that Sonia's been gone. Nobody's talked about her, barely. Yes, dead, gone, goodbye. Yeah, a character that was very central for quite a few years. Kind of like, you know, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Uh, I love the fact that they, if it is true, that they would give her this little bit, bit of, of humanity. humanity. Exactly. After you know, posthum, post, posthumous, posthumous humanity. <laughs> yes. I like it. I think it's a surprise, and I think... Uh, just think it's a surprise all the way around, and I want it to be true. I, I do. Want I want her, it to be true. I want her not just to be a stone-cold sociopath. Yeah. I want her to have really cared about Boomer, which she seemed to. Yes. Because, uh, really, uh, yes, Boomer could protect her, but there were also, there, there was kind of no reason for her to take Boomer under her wing. And actually, I tried to teach her things. Teach her things, except that she, she had an affinity for her. And felt for her. And I think that even if we think that she was really a stone cold, uh, cold uh, sociopath. sociopath, who is, even if she's like incapable of actually loving somebody, um, the way that I can explain that, uh, the relationship like that is that she did get rewards from that relationship in terms of Sonia liked to think of herself as somebody who betters. Uh, exactly. Other people she really who better see her herself that way. Yes, she thought she was a benevolent person, and so to me, her relationship with Lulu, Boomer. But. Yeah, but but she could have felt that that was her, you know, taking somebody mm -hmm. who was the less fortunate and helping her grow and helping and cultivating her. And so I can definitely see why she would feel Absolutely. that way about her without the need for her to actually have human capability of love and emotion. Mm -hmm. um, and even she, since she didn't think she was going to be dead, she might have reaped something from that. Right. So, uh, so there's even more reason to think that she did it. Because, yeah. Uh, well, Rachel has, and I think you've got that one, with uh, the timeline and why she doesn't think that was true. But I thought when I first heard about it is that, you know, she was she was trying to get into her good graces. She was trying to show her that she is good to her. Mm -hmm. um, Rachel seems to think that it's not really like that. But I'll... 
let me get to, uh, first of all, to some other people um, and your opinions of what happened between uh, Sonia and Boomer and the lawyer. So, so let me first go to Lauren, who says, again, I question if this is a plot-driven thing, stomping on the fledgling connection between Kaz and Boomer and the family unit to sever this and recruit Boomer into either Mari or Rita's ranks in the upcoming showdown. And I was sad to see Boomer slaughtered for Cherry's bashing, her hopes of getting out dashed as soon as they were lit up. What really then was the point of Sonia's lawyer coming in and saying she'd be out soon? So two things here. Unfortunately, knowing Wentworth, I definitely see them going in that direction, that they just use that to make to uh, make Boomer uh, uh, angry at Kaz because she was finally, you know, already kind of settled in and mm -hmm. was okay with Liz, okay with Kaz, and now that pits her against them again and probably will be used somehow by Mari. Um, but also, in terms of uh, what was the point, that would really make me angry if they they kind of dangled that carrot in front of her just to snatch it from her immediately because it's doing that to us really because we care about her so uh, what do you think about that i want it to be real and i think i sort of said uh, already what i no what but I, I mean do you think that uh, do you i know you want it to be real but do you think it is going to be I real i think it could be yeah? real yeah but again because she didn't think she was going to die so even though it was a yeah, but I'm talking from the writer's point of view of using this as a plot device. Oh, yeah. uh, to to instead of having it go really somewhere to just use it to pit her against Kaz. Well, I suppose so because unless it goes somewhere, right. which it could, I suppose, right. then um, it is just a device, yeah. and it's cruel. It's cruel to us. Yeah. It's cruel. I wouldn't like it's it at cruel all. to Boomer, and I. I find it, again, toying with our emotions to the point where, you know, give us a break. Let right. us have something. As someone, Especially for the people that we As someone said early so on in this, uh, yeah. uh, Lauren. Lauren, you know, we Lauren. need something now. Right. We need to get some satisfaction, some, um, some, light, some, some, some happiness. light and happiness. Exactly. And I, 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 if Sonia did it, I really love Yes, it. I would love that. Yeah. Now, uh, Denise says, I don't think Sonia and Boom had Boomer's best interest at heart when she told her attorney to see about re reducing her sentence. There, w there has to be another motive somewhere. Now, if there was another motive, I don't see how it would mean anything now that Sonia is dead. So I think to put it in there with Sonia having an alter uh, ulterior motive is kind of pointless. What's the point? She's dead. Right. Um, now, D says, uh, Sonia showed generosity and empathy to people earlier in the season. Remember, she did pay for Maxine's cancer treatment right. or breast, well, no, she, the breast implant. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, though, at that point she was new to the prison and she was trying to buy people uh, and you know, impress people with her money. So, and Maxine was uh, an enforcer and it was important for her to be, you know, to, to, for her to like her. So there was an ulterior motive there. Uh, that being said, again, well, she does have money and she likes, yeah, and she likes to spend it on people. Now, the whole idea of her doing it to get, uh, to get Boomer to like her more uh, Rachel says doesn't make sense because of the timeline, and here's what Rachel says. Uh, although, before I even read Rachel's, yeah. I say that uh, she could have because she knows that her sentence was she was about to be exonerated. Who? Oh, Sonia. Sonia. Right? And maybe she wanted Boomer to be around uh, out in the world with her. I actually, nah, I don't see that. But I don't see her and Boomer ever Not being together. Not as being friends. No. As someone she could call on. I'm sure she has plenty of people mm. she can call on in the real we world. And in fact, often. I think that uh, Sonia, that to me actually is the perfect reason why it wasn't, why, why it was real. Because, because what could she do for her? No, because Sonia didn't really know she was going to be exonerated until the day before she died. Mm -hmm. So she didn't, so to her up until the, fi the final two days, she had every reason to want Boomer to like her because she thought she was going to be there for a while. Mm -hmm. So actually that is, uh, that shows to me that maybe it was real. real. But let's see what Rachel says. Rachel does not agree. I found the revelation that Sonia had arranged an attorney for Boomer to be contrived. The attorney said Sonia contacted him about a month ago about looking into Boomer's case. Looking back at the timeline we've got, that would mean Sonia made this arrangement about the time that Boomer wasn't speaking to her about the test. Did Sonia do this to get Boomer back on her side? There, towards the end, it didn't seem like Sonia gave a flip about what Boomer thought or felt. But I guess this all added a little more to the weight of Boomer being falsely accused of this assault. Ch cherries, right? Mm -hmm. We all know Boomer is not getting out. And even if by some miracle she did get out, she would be right back in. Well, 
okay, so if she, if Sonia really, if this whole thing is just meant to propel this Vuma story or to, to serve Kaz or Marius or whatever, I would not like it at all. I think that they definitely should, the Wentworth people should feel, and maybe that's part of the problem that they've been having in the last couple of seasons, that they should feel that they can put in things that are not related to anybody's plot being twisted, that are just meant to make us feel good, that are just meant for us to feel better about Sonia, or for us to have hope for Boomer, without having to immediately feel bad about all. her death, or have some, you know, have a surprise, something good. Right, something that doesn't have to serve a plot. Again, we're talking about character versus plot, right? Something that is just for the character, because we care about the characters way more than we care about the plot, okay? So um, that's one thing. The other thing is actually, I disagree about we all know that Boomer is not going to get out because it, we are only, if the show really is about to end and thinking that they might have thought about the fact that the show might mm -hmm. only have another season left, I think that actually would be a wonderful gift from the writers to us to let Boomer, to set Boomer free. And David, hey David, um, has something to say about that. And he says, that's a funny name for a girl. <laughs> If Wentworth is coming to an end, then I would love to see Boomer being released in the finale. I can see Frankie and Bridget arriving to meet her and promising to look after her. Driving off into the sunset would be the perfect end to this series. I so agree. And I think that, you know, if hopefully, if the truth does come out, the Drago was the one who uh, bashed Cherry, and so Boomer gets cleared from all of that, I hope that they can actually move forward with I this I love journey. that idea. Two hot girls in a hot <laughs> car. So they need Coming a little bigger big car. car. <laughs> they need a bigger boat to uh, take Boomer home. I, I love the idea of Boomer getting out at the end of the season, series. Um, and again, they had every reason to believe that it could come to an end at the end of, at the end of season seven. And even if it didn't, Boomer had, would have been there for seven years already. She would have totally been, you know, a, it would have totally been a great thing for her to, so. to be released. So hopefully, even if it, even if for now it will seem like it was there to serve a plot, hopefully maybe in season seven it will come back as well, something that could actually we live in be hope. real. And anyway, these people are very good writers. So yes, they are. Uh, yes. Yes. Now let's talk about Rita a little bit. Um, and I, I liked what Sarah had to say about Rita. For the first time, I really felt an emotional pull toward Rita. She's been a fascinating character from the beginning, but like Ray says, she was always holding back. We finally got a glimpse into Rita's emotional center. Not all the way, she's still holding a lot back, but there was finally a crack in the armor. Um, I, I still feel that we need to see more of Rita's actual... Because she's rich. She's a internal, rich character. Yeah, internal life, her own story. I feel that she's also been really mostly used in other people's storylines and... Uh, if I go back to um, when we first started talking about how much we love Rita, which was about six episodes ago, uh, I think they haven't done nearly enough with mm -hmm. her in this uh, in these six episodes. Um, what uh, what did Rachel say about Rita? Rachel said, uh, while Rita understands she has a job to do as an undercover officer, she doesn't emotionally protect herself from the pitfalls of that life. She knows how to protect herself physically, but emotional damage can be much more crippling in the long run. Rita will soon have to choose between being a cop and being a member of the Wentworth family. I don't think she's going to choose being a cop. Well, I think she would have in any other circumstance except because of Ruby. Um, and I think that, uh, again, uh, Leah told us that Rita has a lot of uh, very emotional stuff coming up. Now, unless she was talking about season seven, because remember when we were talking to her, she, she, was had, just, still shooting. she had just finished shooting season seven, so it could have... She could have been talking about season seven. I still think Ruby's going to die. Well, she has, there again, there are only two episodes to go, so some big things have to happen because I don't see her saying that there was a lot of emotional stuff happening just by her breaking up with Ray. That didn't no. really show any, you know, not, that wasn't a lot no, of emotion. No, it was very already. subtle emotion. Yeah. Though I did uh, like that they had that sweet moment between her and Ruby, Ruby comforting her, mm -hmm. her and consoling her for the breakup. And uh, David says that he believes that Rita will have to kill Drago to protect Ruby, which seems to me like it could make a lot of sense. Um, Although I'd hate to lose Drago. I, isn't it interesting I'd that all of a sudden Ruby. you like Drago? <laughs> uh, the only thing about Drago is that I would like for her, if she is going to stay in prison uh, and become part of the main cast, or, you know, I, she has to be a little less 
Yeah, she's she's a yeah. stone cold killer. Yeah, she we she has to be more refined. Mm -hmm. now in, in yeah. All right, now let's talk about Vera, Will, and Jake. My least favorite story. Isn't it funny? <laughs> well, because it involves Ferguson. I know. Now, and and that is a big thing here. Uh, first of all, some of you say that they are highly entertaining, seeing them, the three of them together. The three stooges. <laughs> the three stooges, the three musketeers. Um, I think it's more like the, the three, three stooges. stooges. Uh, Shannon especially says, you know, Vera's verbal abuse of Jake has been like the most entertaining <laughs> thing the entire season, which I so agree because also we're finally, you know, rooting for Vera for not being this yeah, little mouse. No, but I'm finally like, yes, thank you for being, you know, never, not... Time after time, he tries to trick her, and she's like, nope, I'm not buying this bullshit. So I'm just so thrilled that they're letting my Vera still, you know, keep her strength. And, uh, she's so great. I mean, I don't think, again, we don't talk about Kate Atkins no, as, we as, don't, as, as, much her, as we should. as much as we should. She is just a wonderful actress. She really is. And that, now, that, again, that we've seen her in um, Jack, Jack Irish, and as a hilarious, hilarious character, uh, you can really see the breadth of her talent. Um, She's a fine actress, and I love her. I just love her. She is. You know, one of the things that I always wonder about, she walks kind of like this. Yes, kind of in a tilt. It kind of cro crooked, and I, I always wonder if that's Kate, which I don't think she no, was like that in Jake Irish. Like so the Jack fact Irish. that she made that that physical uh, that attribute, little attribute for Vera is so brilliant to me. That's uh, one of the, those little details. I always think it's because she carries too heavy a purse. I think that it's because uh, she's so uptight, tight. you know. Um, so, uh, Shannon did say, though, uh, so there seems to be a shift in the plot line now from is the freak alive to who is blackmailing Vera. Now, it seems, it does seem in this episode like, okay, they, they seem to be fairly convinced that it's Joan in the box as opposed to all of our is she, is it not, is it Debbie, is it V, is it other people. Um, they seem to be satisfied that it is Joan. And in that case, then it does seem like they've moved on to now who is blackmailing Vera with, rather than is the freak alive. And I have to agree with Jen from last week. It does kind of feel like an anticlimax. Don't you feel like there was, is she alive? Is she alive? Oh, yes, yeah, she's alive. Okay, now let's move No, on. she's dead. I mean, no, yes, she's dead. <laughs> See what happens? It's Freudian. Well, but, I think there has to be some kind, you know, either she's alive, which none of us I wanted, know, or she's but dead. Kind of... But they're keeping it going with yeah. the blackmail thing. But to me... You know, the only reason I think that it's not one of those um, substitute bodies is because where would she? No, I'm no, just, no. You it know, feels, yeah. I, I think we're definitely moving on. To me, it just feels like after all this, you know, uh, yes, all but this they hype, built up to it. But then it kind of just, well, but now we now now there's the yeah, the blackmail know. plot. I, I feel that the whole blackmail uh, blackmail plot, personally, yeah. I feel was just a way for them to give. They, uh, Jake, Vera, and Will, a storyline that brings them all together, I feel that it's not, it wouldn't have been my ideal choice of storyline for them. I think that, especially Vera, there are so many other things they could do with her. Mm -hmm. um, eh. uh, and, and kind of an, uh, an excuse to keep Jake around and make him relevant. I don't know. Um, but let's see what Lauren says about this. Lauren says, the biggest storyline right now is Vera's stalker. And I just really don't care. <laughs> I'm supposed to care, but I don't. Mainly because I think there's no point trying to figure out who it is since so many threads have been precariously tied together in the last season and this one. If that is the big reveal of season six, then I'm sorry. It's a massive let letdown. I feel as though this storyline has truly already played itself out, yeah. and we're just being strung along from episode to episode going down this rabbit hole with Vera, Will, and Jake. Sorry, with Vera, Will, and Jake. Now someone is asking for $500,000. And in next week's preview, there is some Frankie Stalker-style photo <laughs> wall in a shed. I'm surprised that they're doing a stalker storyline so soon after the season five. That's an interesting point. I forgot. Mm -hmm. about, I mean, I didn't forget about it, but I didn't think back yeah. to it. The, the parallel just happened, right? Yeah, because of well, we'll see who it is. I mean, who? I mean, would would Channing actually plaster these cl clippings on a white? It sort of doesn't only seem like if his he's kind of lost his mind. Yeah, it doesn't seem like his mo. Well, who is? Who would? I don't know. But that's me, the question. I think. Who would yeah. do that? 
I Who would care enough to do that? Oh, it's not even care enough. It's like it's 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 a way of like making some making her really uh, uh, scared to have all. I don't know. It's weird. Who cares? Th those are Joan pictures. Yeah, I know. I don't so, know. but I'll tell you what. I I do find it weird that they're both uh, the Jake and the Will both. Well, more Jake, but anyway, the, the assumption is that Vera is the one that has to pay. Yeah. Why? It's not even her crime. And She's the one who's, who has the the least involvement in this crime. Exactly. And, yes, we know Vera has a house and a little bit of money. I think Will has a house, too, by the way. But $500,000 seems like a ridiculously <laughs> high amount to expect Vera to pay off of $10,000, so maybe, unless... and then you can come back, as she says... Blackmailers always well, do. Well, so this is either, I mean, if the, if the writers did it intentionally to make us think, well, this is a very childish kind of uh, blackmailing going on, then it could be one of those, you know, and if we add that to who plastered all the clippings, which doesn't seem like, again, this makes me think that it can't be Channing. Or Shane. Or Shane or Murphy or, I don't Yes, know. but what... What would, why would Murphy have the pictures up? I don't know. This Who is what I'm saying. Who would want to make weird. a wall of which, which is Ferguson saying, photos? Which is why I think Lauren is saying that she is, she's not letting herself completely engage with it because she thinks it's going to be one of those, like with Panisi, like out of the blue things that blue. doesn't matter, that they just wanted to keep the story going for the entire season to have, you know, Vera, Jake, and Will have something to do, and, but, but that the payoff is not going to be very payoffy. y um, We'll see. Diva. I don't see how it could. I can't The either. only thing Unless that could they make really it surprise. is if it's Vera. Uh, not Vera, if it's Joan. And I don't want it to be Joan. And Joan wouldn't put pictures of herself on a wall. Oh, anyway. Joan would definitely do that. Oh, no, no. Oh, she to, would definitely. For what, to what end? To, to creep her out, to mess with her brain. Oh, oh she could totally do that. Um, now, this says, and it's kind of a, a, an aside, but I do wonder about that. Not that I think it has meaning, but it's one of those little details which make me think, Why? <laughs> Uh, that Vera is charging her phone in another room when someone has broken into her home. That doesn't seem right, especially for a law enforcement officer. I, I'm not even thinking from you the... You charge your phone in another room, but yeah, you're not a law enforcement I, I officer. I do, but I think most people don't. And I'm not even talking about the law officer point of view. I'm just saying when you're a filmmaker or a TV movie maker or whatever, a TV uh, series maker, and you want to do a show and, and somebody gets a text message in the middle of the night, why would you leave their phone in another room? That means you have to do another scene, another set, you know, you have to go there. And it would, it would have did, but just been easier to do her looking under the bed, going to sleep, and all of a sudden waking up and looking at her phone next to her bed. It's, it's a weird choice to put her phone all the way out in the living room. So I'm just I wonder wondering why. If it, I'm wondering if, if it's it supposed a, to mean if something. If it has a, yeah. And I think Dee is right, especially after she, her house has been broken into. Wouldn't you want to have your phone close to you if God forbid something happened mm -hmm. that you could call somebody really quickly? Yes. So that is seem to be a weird choice. I wonder if it has to mean something or if it's just, I don't know, the director keeps her phone in the living room, so she just did. I don't know. Um, Do you? If you're watching us, <laughs> Fiona? Fiona? <laughs> um, okay, where were we? Oh, I yes. Okay. So... Uh, now, oh yes, before we go into uh, predictions and theories, I just want to say that, uh, I just want to pose this question. Uh, if we see the, the episode starts in the elevator, with the elevator scene with Jake, Will, and Vera, which by the way, I love that elevator scene. Um, and I'm just wondering if Vera and Will's relationship now is, if, if it could recover from this. I hope so. She seems to resent him for involving her in this, and, and also I'm sure that she feels differently about him now that she knows that he can bury somebody alive. So I'm just wondering if, if that relationship is... Well, I is, want it uh, to recover doing... very much. Yeah, but, but, but is it realistic for it to recover? So, I don't know. Um, okay, let's start with Shannon's theory. Shannon thinks, Jake seems to be hell-bent on getting Vera's money and talked about it several times this episode, which suggests to me that he is involved in that scheme with Channing. I guess it's possible that Jake is also just really worried about saving his own ass, but it's more likely he would try to profit from this situation in any way he could. And since Vera has been shooting him down at every opportunity, it makes more sense that he would try to get back at her this way. He's in a win-win situation because he'll either get a big payoff or Vera will lose her job once her involvement is found out. Jake could easily pin Jasper's hit on Turk since he was the one who got paid for it. Ferguson did threaten Jake that the paper trail for the 90K would lead back to him, but it seems like the writers may have 
forgotten this point. Yeah, I always thought that it was, well, not always, when we found out that Ferguson paid Turk directly, I always thought it was, I always, again, I thought it was weird because why would she pay him directly when Jake is the one doing yes, the job? Yes, but she made a paper trail. Well, yes, but wouldn't it have just been easier to pay him directly and say, um, but I guess maybe Jake wouldn't, wasn't willing to do that so it doesn't uh, connect him to it. Mm -hmm. um, now, here's the thing, and I also thought throughout the episode when he constantly, like, make her pay, make her pay, make her pay, and I thought, okay, so I guess they want us to think that it was him. Um, but then we remembered that right after Vera says, Vera tells them, nobody else knows this, right? You're sure about nobody else knows about Ferguson, right? And they say, no, no, of course not. And then, of course, Will goes to Kaz to make sure she hasn't told anybody. And Jake goes to Allie to make sure that she didn't tell anybody. So the fact that he, in a private moment, and we'll talk about private moments right. now, uh, tell them what we think about private moments. Well, private moments are when you really see what's going on. And if a writer betrays a private moment, to me, that's the end of things right, for so, me. So, because so people, the way people behave when nobody is supposedly watching them right. uh, is their, it's supposed to be it's their reality. Yeah. It's revealing of what's true, what's not true. And you're supposed to be able to believe those private moments because there's no reason him going to Ali should be anything other than him trying to find out that everything's okay. Right. Uh, if he legitimately. Knew, if he knew if he who did knew, it because he was involved, exactly, he wouldn't have why to, would go to have to go to Ali. And he, it's not like uh, Vera, I mean, he's not doing it for appearances. Because actually, it's the opposite. Vera's not supposed to know that Ali right. knows. And to me, when a writer, it's paramount that a writer not betray a private moment or use a private moment to mislead uh, an audience or direct them in a certain way because then you that's can't... opposite of what that moment reveals. Right, because then you can't count you can't on trust anything. Them. You have to mm -hmm. be able to, I mean, if, if they really want to engage the audience and all, see if you can figure that out, then they have to be true. They have to give us only Absolutely. correct Absolutely. The truth clues. of the private moment has got to be absolute. So if we're going by that, then it can't be Jake. And actually, the more they shove it in our faces, the less I think less it was him. obvious, it seems. Same thing, by the way, for Channing. The fact that he says, oh, it must have been Channing, makes me think, oh, it must not be Channing, you know? So, but definitely about Jake. Um, David has a weird out of the blue theory. That's a theory. couple of interesting theories. In yeah. There. Well, David's theory, I, I think, is completely out of the blue, but who knows for, for Wentworth. Ferguson's therapist. Season 4, oh, episode 3, he was blackmailed and manipulated by Ferguson. He knew her deepest and darkest secrets. So far, so good. But what grudge would he have against Vera? That's the part that I don't, that I wouldn't, you know, can't figure out why he would do that. Plus, again, it doesn't seem to be... Again, out of the blue. Yeah. Yeah. And what would he have against Vera? Absolutely nothing. Yeah, I mean, he would have a lot Ferguson against Ferguson. Ferguson is the only one he would have something against. Right. Exactly. So unless it's something that has... Uh, and that would explain the wall. You know, yeah, but um, he was upset. He with didn't him. seem insane. Well, we only saw him in flashback yeah. for a few seconds, but it would be like bringing him completely out of the blue. Uh, let's see, Cappy. Although it's interesting, who even remembered him? Good, David. Good memory, David. <laughs> uh, you're really paying attention. Oh yes. Now, when, maybe when da fans maybe David too. started binging. That's when you really remember things. Is when you start late and you binge. Maybe. Then all of these things come to the fore that we've long forgotten. Or, or uh, maybe he's like a lot of other Wentworth fans who every year watch all of all the seasons season. again. <laughs> exactly. Um, so look at you, Sarah. Now, <laughs> um, uh, this is very interesting, Kathy. Although I do like the idea that Miles is the one stalking Vera, I'm just not sure that she's that evil, and I don't want her to be. Well, I don't know that the stalker has been e Oh, with the, with the, oh. With the, the, the especially the bird. Yes. yes. So I think I've got this figured out, and I wonder how many others have come to the same conclusion. Originally, I thought it was Nurse Radcliffe, but now I'm thinking that it's Radcliffe and Jake in cahoots. That's why things happen when Jake is at work. Radcliffe is doing it for revenge, but Jake is doing it for the money. He knows that Vera has money, and that's why he keeps trying to convince her to pay the blackmailer. Only Jake, Will, and Vera know, knew they were going to dig up that grave. So, of course, Jake told Radcliffe where to go with the camera. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? Yeah, except, again, I don't think Jake knows, and I don't think Radcliffe is, is as crazy either, that she would yes. kill a bird and or do all that smart stuff. Enough. Uh, Jake also tried suggesting to Vera that it was Channing to take suspicion off him. Although Kaz and Allie know Ferguson is dead, I don't think either one of them would say anything. They're just glad it's over and want to put it all in the past. 
This could really bite Jake in the ass if Vera doesn't pay the ransom because now Radcliffe knows everything. I really don't think it's Radcliffe, but while I was listening to this, I was thinking, I go back to the pips going back on uh, Vera's uh, jacket, and it seems to me, first of all, it has to have been somebody with an access to job. an inside job or somebody who knows enough people who would let him in. Either way, wouldn't Vera look at the CCTV to see who accessed her office well, during course, the night? Well, somebody could have moved the CCTV uh, but we don't with even a broom. See, we don't even see an attempt to find out, which is weird, because it, it had to have been somebody with access to her office, somebody with either a, a, a card or somebody who either worked there Unless or knows... Unless it's the dry that cleaner that that's doing right, it. Right, yes. Um, now Turns Lauren, out the dry cleaner is... Um, Someone's cousin. <laughs> Ferguson's cousin? Ferguson's cousin, or... Uh, a Goldie? A Goldie wife is on the the Daisy thing. Oh, yes! <laughs> Hello, little Miss Goldfinch! A Goldfinch. Um, oh, she's so sweet. Now, Lauren, I, I don't know, Lauren, I think we're past this, but uh, she thinks that uh, the whole maybe you'll need me one day, the Jake says to Vera, is forecasting into the future when Vera realizes she's still pregnant with this child. I think we're poor, we're sort of past the pregnancy oh God, story. I, I hope think so. what was it, episode three? I think we're I think we're done by now with the pregnancy story. Um, so I, I really don't know at this point. It, it's they will have to come up with something so spectacularly brilliant for me to say, oh, that storyline was great because. Otherwise, I am getting into the very worrisome territory of I think they're just going to bring somebody out of the blue, uh, which would have just like to justify the fact that they had them running around. It like, would be like, such a shame. I mean, mean it start the season started off so, so strongly, and brilliantly. And such you know a why bang. it started off so strongly? Because they had the new characters come in, and so we got to know them a little better. Mm -hmm. We got to know Kaz's top dog. The focus was more on the characters very, at the beginning. Very well written, and, very well performed. But now Made they're sense. now they're putting more the emphasis on the plot and how it's twisting. Who done it? Uh, and they made some choices about going with a certain couple where they should have gone with another couple, or at least you know not not necessarily the romantic couple, but as a intense relationship mm -hmm. kind of a thing. So, but two more episodes, a lot can happen. Uh, and I'm again, I'm loving the fact that so many new writers are writing in, which means that you know a lot of we you really are feeling involved. Too. Well, and I think that that means that a lot of people are you know have something to say and they wanna they have to let they it have out. to say it. So I love that. And keep emailing us, uh, ladypartsvlog at gmail dot com. Um, you know, we're just Mimi and I were just talking before this about how um, when you did the soap magazine and uh, fans wrote in and mm -hmm. you would post their their reactions and some of the. Some people from the soap world One did not react. One of the great writers well. of, of daytime just went crazy. He said, you know, it's all right if you criticize us, and we had just taught them how to be criticized because no one ever criticized uh, anybody in the soap world. It was all adoration. Uh, he said, because you are a professional, but to let the fans tell us what to do, it was, it was so devastating. He said he thought he wanted to quit writing if that was going to happen. Well, and the, the irony is, is that as we're reading these emails, they're so eloquent, they're so observant, they're so They care so deeply, you well, all care also, so deeply, and you, this is for you. Well, not only that, but li listen to these emails. These people have put so much thought mm -hmm. into this, they have watched and rewatched and know everything. I, I mean, at this point, you probably know the story world better than... They do. Yeah, probably. Um, you care, and uh, you're just so brilliant. You always come up with things, and I'm like, oh, I haven't even thought about that. Mm -hmm. So thank you again. As always, as, I, as you know, this would have been nothing without no, you. No, we wouldn't have Talking to you without you. We wouldn't you. have it, it and be, it wouldn't have been nearly as just be us, just we're not nearly as interesting as you are. <laughs> so keep emailing us, lady blog, ladypartsvlog at gmail.com, and uh, start thinking about your party um, submissions and... We will see you again next week for the pen, uh, pen, penultimate, penultimate. penultimate mm -hmm. episode. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.